passing rapidly for both Lindsay and Jan, as they are both at 32 weeks. Lindsay, the adolescent, is struggling with substance abuse. Jan, who has a history of obesity and hypertension, is preeclamptic. Lindsay has come into the clinic as an urgent patient. Hey, Dr. Montgomery. Hey, Lindsay, how's it going? I understand that you're leaking some fluid from your vagina. Um, yeah, I started bleeding last night. Have you been having any contractions? I guess so. I mean, it kind of feels like bad cramps. Mm-hmm. Okay, when did those start and how far apart are they? Just a few hours ago. It doesn't happen all that often, like every half an hour or so. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt bad or anything. Okay, well, did you have sex last night? Yeah. Did you do any drugs or drink any alcohol? No, I didn't do any drugs or smoke, but I had a few beers. Lindsay. Well, this guy offered me a beer and I Okay, wanted... look, before we can even examine you, I'm going to have to take an ultrasound so that I know what's going on. Fine, but is it going to take long because I have a date tonight? Vaginal bleeding later in pregnancy may simply be caused by intercourse. However, there may be other, more serious reasons for it, such as placenta previa, a state where the placenta is partially or completely blocking the birth canal. Or placental abruption, when the placenta separates from the uterine wall. Pelvic exams are contraindicated until placenta previa has been ruled out because of the risk of hemorrhage. Because both placenta previa and placental abruption may be associated with significant blood loss or shock, the mother's pulse, blood pressure, respiratory status and level of consciousness should be closely observed. In addition, the fetal heart rate should be monitored. Well, the placenta is rather low in your uterus, Lindsay. It, it could be placenta previa, which means that it would block the movement of the baby through your birth canal. I don't understand. There are different levels of placenta previa. A low-lying placenta does not reach the internal cervical laws. Vaginal delivery is possible with this condition. Partial previa, in which the placenta covers part of the internal cervical os. Complete previa, placenta covers the internal cervical os. You're also having contractions, so I'm going to have you transported to the hospital where we can better evaluate and treat you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, why do I have to go to the hospital? Can't the bleeding just be from doing it last night? Well, that's a possible explanation, but the ultrasound says otherwise. Look, I need you in the hospital because if this bleeding doesn't stop, we may have to deliver your baby right away. Okay, I'm really scared. My parents still aren't talking to me. I think they're mad at me for having this kid. And I understand that, but look, I'm concerned about your safety and the safety of your baby. I'll have the nurse phone for an ambulance. We'll transport you to the hospital and I'll be right there. Okay. You'll be there soon? Of course. As more and more of the os is covered by the placenta, cesarean delivery is recommended. Lindsay's parents were called and told she was being transported to the hospital for vaginal bleeding and threatened preterm labor. Upon arrival to the labor and delivery unit, Lindsay was assessed for signs of labor by palpation of the uterus to note uterine tone and contractions. Cardiotachography was used to evaluate fetal heart rate and uterine activity. While performing the admission exam, the nurse noted that the vaginal bleeding that Lindsay and her physician described was diminished. Even so, performing a pelvic examination on Lindsay would be contraindicated because of the possible placenta previa. A complete ultrasound was later performed and confirmed a low-lying placenta, not previa. A vaginal exam was then done and revealed that Lindsay's cervix was three centimeters dilated. Well, Lindsay, it looks like you're in premature labor. Because you're at 32 weeks, I'm going to ask the nurse to give you some medication to try to stop the contractions. Okay. Various pharmacologic agents can be used in the management of preterm labor in an effort to diminish contractions and postpone delivery. They include tocolytic drugs such as magnesium sulfate, nifedipine, and terbutaline, 
as well as NSAIDs such as endomethacin. I'm also going to order medication that will help protect your baby's lungs because he or she is being born so early. Okay. Steroids such as betamethasone and dexamethasone are administered to women at risk for premature delivery. Administration of these drugs is associated with decreased risk and severity of respiratory distress syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis in the premature infant. Optimal effects occur 24 hours after completion of therapy. Okay, well our goal is to try and keep the contractions away for 48 hours so that the steroids will have a chance to take effect. Okay. Have any questions, Lindsay? No. The nurse administers nifedipine and the first dose of betamethasone. The second dose of betamethasone will be given in 24 hours. Over the next 48 hours, the nurse will assess Lindsay for signs of labor, including increasing frequency or intensity of contractions, vaginal bleeding, and side effects of tocolytic therapy, such as headaches, dizziness, hypotension, and tachycardia. Fetal well-being will be assessed with the use of continuous electronic fetal monitoring. Okay, Lindsay, I'm going to hook you up to a fetal monitor, and that way we can monitor the baby's heart rate while you're having contractions. Okay. Okay. Electronic fetal monitoring is a tool for the assessment of the adequacy of fetal oxygenation. Tracings are evaluated for characteristic patterns that occur as a result of hypoxic and non-hypoxic stresses or stimulation. Evaluation of these tracings includes assessment of baseline characteristics, including determination of fetal heart rate, which should be between 100 and 160 beats per minute, periodic and episodic changes, and uterine contractions. Tachycardia, or baseline heart rate greater than 160, can be associated with maternal fever, infection, hypovolemia, or dehydration. It may also be due to fetal hypoxia, cardiac anomalies, or drugs administered to the mother. Bradycardia, where baseline fetal heart rate is below 110 beats per minute for at least 10 minutes, can also occur. This can be a benign condition due to fetal maturation, head compression, or second stage labor. It can also result from severe fetal hypoxia, acidosis, or uncorrected umbilical cord compression. The tracing is also assessed for variability, which is defined as irregular fluctuations in the baseline. The normal finding is moderate variability or recurrent fluctuations of between 6 and 25 beats per minute. Decreased variability may be associated with fetal sleep, hypoxia, or the effects of drugs administered to the mother. Absent variability may occur with fetal acidosis, neurologic injury, or central nervous system anomaly. Accelerations can also be noted. These are defined as an abrupt rise from the baseline of at least 15 beats per minute with a duration of at least 15 seconds. There are three types of decelerations. Early decelerations are a result of fetal head compression during uterine contraction. This causes vagal stimulation and slowing of the heart rate, usually not more than 20 to 30 beats below the baseline. This type of deceleration has a gradual onset that begins at the start of the contraction and a slow return to the baseline that occurs with the end of the contraction. These decelerations are not indicative of fetal compromise. Another is late decelerations, which also have a gradual onset. They reach their nadir, or lowest point, after the peak of the contraction and do not return to baseline until after the contraction ends. These decelerations are associated with uteroplacental insufficiency, or inadequate exchange of oxygen between mother and fetus, and may be the result of conditions such as maternal hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes, hypovolemia, anemia, and placental abruption. The third type of deceleration is variable, which occurs randomly. It is characterized by an abrupt drop from and return to baseline. Its relationship to contractions is not consistent 
and it usually occurs with umbilical cord compression.
Spinal anesthesia is similar to an epidural. In this case, however, small amounts of anesthetic are rapidly delivered into the cerebrospinal fluid to provide analgesia and anesthesia. This is also scary. I know it can be overwhelming. We really need to get the baby out as soon as possible. Before the anesthesiologist can administer the spinal anesthesia, or the obstetrician can perform the cesarean delivery, they must get informed consent from Jan. This includes explaining the procedure, as well as risks, benefits, side effects, and alternative methods. Jan is prepped for the procedure. An indwelling urinary catheter is placed, and pulse ox, cardiorespiratory, and BP monitors are attached. Jan is monitored closely during the procedure. The anesthesiologist watches her cardiorespiratory status, including frequent blood pressure readings, and observes for clinical signs of pulmonary edema. Jan, you have a beautiful baby girl. We have now seen each of these women as they have progressed through their high-risk pregnancies to give birth. Each one will now go home and face the challenge of parenthood.